Today it's harvesting day here at Sonoma Farm at Sweetwater Spectrum, and I'm going to go through a full day of harvesting microgreens with farmer and grower Luke Carniel. Stay tuned for that coming up. When it comes to microgreens, I think everybody's attracted to them for the value that they bring per tray. You can have a 10 by 20 inch size tray sell for 20 or more dollars. It's attractive on a numbers basis, but there's a lot that goes into that. And what I've found from talking to a lot of farmers, visiting a lot of farms, the worst part about farming often is the harvesting. So today we're gonna to see what it's like to harvest 40 or so microgreen trays, to get them ready to go to customers tomorrow. It's the non-glorious part of growing microgreens. This greenhouse is 20 by 40 feet roughly. So what would that be? That's 800 square feet, I think. Um, nice vertical space. And uh, yeah, it's not a huge greenhouse, but we, we pump a decent amount out of it. In your current business, how many trays a week are you growing of microgreens? Right now we're doing between 100 and 120. Um, uh, usually about 120 per week at this point in the summer. Um, but yeah, between 100 and 120. Now of those 120, what, where are they going? Who are your customers? The majority of the microgreen sales are going to wholesale customers. So we sell to um, three distributors in the area um, and they basically resell them to restaurants primarily um, so a lot of the a lot of the product is ending up in restaurants in the city and honestly I don't always know 100% of who where it goes it changes um, and then so I would say about 70 75% of our sales are wholesale to those three distributors and then the remainder is um, farmer's market and restaurants. You, know, you have some field crops growing here. You're growing 100 and 120 microgreen trays a week. Would you say this is a microgreen farm? Yeah, that's a good question. It's becoming more and more a microgreen farm. And it's not necessarily how I or we envisioned it from the beginning, but um, that's just the direction that it's gone, um, partially just following what uh, the path that makes the most sense financially um, and also with this amazing greenhouse that we have you know f just uh, using it to its full capacity um, and we did we still do uh, grow in the, in the field I love field growing um, we have a hoop house this year that's keeping me busy and interested in everything but but you know the majority of our effort and certainly the majority of, of you know where we're making our money is coming from the greenhouse is coming from the microgreens we're in Sonoma, a lot of wineries, a lot of farm-to-table type restaurants are high-end eating. This seems like it would be a dream location for microgreens given the food culture around here. Mm -hmm. How's it been for you selling them? Yeah, I, I mean, I think that you're definitely, you're right that it is a great location for, for you know, well, vegetable farming, organic, small-scale, sustainable vegetable farming, and specifically with the micros because it is um, an area that's surrounded by, um, you know, upscale restaurants and and caterers who are throwing huge events at wineries and whatnot. That that um, there is a demand for microgreens locally in Sonoma County. Um, now, that being said, still the majority of our stuff, I think, is is, is it is still ending up in the city in San Francisco. Um, but that's more of a of a function of of it being more convenient for us to, just, to deliver to these distributors who are, their customers happen to be in, in San Francisco for the most part, in the, in the Bay Area, closer into the city. Um, but one of our distributors, um, actually two of our distributors do distribute a fair amount in Sonoma County, in Sonoma, like Marin, Napa County, like the North Bay of San Francisco. And um, so, there's definitely, it's a perfect area because even, you know, Sonoma itself is great for the microgreens and for, for uh, vegetables and everything. And then we're close to San Francisco, uh, which is, you know, obviously a mecca for, for local food culture and chefs who are pushing the envelope and, and looking for high quality produce and microgreens. The market that you're in, Sonoma here, you said it's a really good market. 
you're able to export to all these distributors. Given the space you're in here, 800 square feet of greenhouse, are you at capacity given your growing constraints, meaning growing in this greenhouse, and are you at capacity given how much you can push into the market? And I guess the third limiting factor is labor. Can, could you grow more? Is anything stopping you from growing or are you kind of at that sweet spot of where you want to be? Yeah, so um, the first question about uh, you know being at capacity in our greenhouse space, um, I would say we could definitely grow more. Um, we're at capacity, I would say, with our current system and our current setup in this space, but we could add, we could add a couple more tables um, and we could also probably make better use of vertical space. We really don't, besides, besides stacking the microgreens when we're germinating them, we don't use a whole lot of vertical space. Um, so I would say we're more or less at capacity right now uh, in this greenhouse with, you know, 120, 125 trays is probably the most that we've been able to, to do and not feel like we're really stretching the space with its current setup. But we could add more tables and we could do a couple more things if we felt like we needed to. And then as far as the uh, capacity for demand, um, I would say um, there is there's more demand out there. It's just a matter, and, and there are a couple, you know, much, much larger microgreens operations in California. And I know in Southern California, there's at least one huge one. And so there's, you know, there's, there's, there is demand. We're not, um, we are, we're always looking for more demand, I guess. But right now, I think we're, we're pretty happy with where, you know, where we are. Uh, the, the kind of, it's not, a, it's not a perfect, you know, supply and demand balance. But, we're, but every week, it feels like we're getting close as our orders become more and more consistent. We know exactly what to produce. Um, you know, we're, we're producing enough that we're, we're making enough week to week. Um, uh, that that we feel pretty comfortable, um, but, but I mean, yeah. If this volume and what you're growing, would you say this is financially sustainable for you as a business? You know, can you get a living wage out of this? You have an employee. Yeah. Can it pay for itself? Like, is there enough yeah. money left over at the end of the day that it doesn't have to grow? Sure. So we have a little bit of a unique setup here in that I'm I'm paid a salary to be completely transparent by Sweetwater Spectrum, which is the nonprofit, you know, parent um, nonprofit organization that um, you know basically gives me permission to use the farm here, and and the farm is is um, is partially here for the for the benefit of the nonprofit and for. Um, the residents who, who live here, who are adults with autism, who live here, 15 residents for them, you know, to enjoy the farm and, and it's, and it's uh, the vegetables and everything. <clears throat> so I'm, I'm, so it's a little bit of a unique situation that I'm paid a salary. My, my coworker Rob is, is, is paid a salary. So our, our pay is, uh, it's um, static, you know, it stay, it's stable. It stays the same regardless of how much we're making. But that being said, we want the farm to justify our salary. We want, right. we like to think, even though it's a nonprofit, we still budget it out totally separate from the nonprofit. I think it, I think of it as its own entity so that we're, you know, I, I want the, the income from the farm to the revenue from the farm to cover my salary, my coworker, Rob, um, Rob's salary and all the inputs. Sure. And so right now, uh, long story short, pretty much doing 120 trays a week is pretty much just gotten us to that point where it's, um, if we can keep at this, you know, throughout the year, then that is kind of the break even point where it's covering my salary. It's covering the work expenses, or sorry, the labor expenses and all the um, inputs. So if you weren't under the nonprofit umbrella and we just chunk this sure. business out right now at 120 trays a week given your current markets, Yeah, you'd be able to pay yourself a salary yeah. from the farm profit. Yes, yeah, I mean, um, I, I think so. I mean, basically, uh, you know, we are making $1,800 average a week on, so, so that's... Um, profiting, profits, eight, profiting yeah. 1800 So yeah, so we're, so we're uh, you know, hoping, so that, 
pretty much comes out to about $90,000 gross profit in a year. And then um, if you were to chunk this out to it's like, it's, you know, outside of a nonprofit. Um, and then, you know, our, our expenses are about $25,000 a year. And that doesn't count like the capital expense of the greenhouse and everything. But um, so basically, you know, depending on how much you want to pay yourself, and sure, you know, sure. it, it, it's doable. The, and the I think the economics work, the economics work basically. And um, I mean, our goal to be transparent is to basically get to, we do want to grow a bit to making our, our goal is a hundred thousand dollars gross um, profit in a year. So we want to get it to basically $2,000 um, revenue a week. Okay. And we're, you know, some weeks we're there and some we're not. So right now we're averaging at $1,800 a week, which we feel pretty happy about. Pretty good out of um, 1,800 square feet. Right. You know, and yeah. selling microgreens. When you look at the microgreens that you sell, what's the average retail value of a tray you're selling when you think about all the market streams? Because you have restaurants, you have farmer's market, you have a wholesaler. Where's right. kind of the average, and if you think about all the crops, 20 bucks? Somewhere it's, a, it's um it's depending on the variety it's pretty much i would say to be conservative it's about uh it's between 15 and 20 dollars so it, it depends on the variety but i would i would say it's it's probably about 17 dollars you know it's kind of smack dab in between 15 and 20 so um well on a 17 dollar trade do you have a sense of where your costs are five ish per trade somewhere? yeah you know that's a i have that that number broken down it's and and it it does come out to be about Although, you know, we changed up some of our expenses since that, you know, we changed up our tray, the trays we've done, the trays that we use since I, I did that cost analysis, but I think it's about five or $6 per tray to produce. Um, and, you know, we're reusing all of our trays, uh, you know, occasionally we'll deliver to somebody and they don't return it, but, you know, we haven't had to buy in new trays in, in a long time. Our probably, you know, our most, ex our, our, our largest expenses are soil um, the soil mix that we use, which we import, uh, it's an organic potting mix and our seed. And then the labor. And, and the labor, and the labor, of course. What are the different types of microgreens that you grow? Um, we grow, right now it's about, um, seven or eight varieties. Uh, and, and, you know, we used to grow more. We used to, actually, even just this last winter, we were experimenting with a ton of different of different varieties uh, for one of our customers in particular. And we love to grow the funky stuff and we're starting to get a little bit back into it. But right now we've really kind of whittled it down to the, the ones that we like to grow, the ones that we know we'll have, um, you know, the demand for. So, um, so yeah, it's, it's about seven varieties I think that we're doing on the regular week in week out where we have to do them or else customers are going to be like where is our cilantro where's our bull's blood um so yeah and then we grow a few funky ones on the side and uh that uh one is one distributor in particular likes the the more funky stuff and they're selling to some of the more upscale uh um you know hipster restaurants in san francisco that want to use some of the, you know, they want to use dill, they want to use fenugreek, something like that. So, um, yeah. What are your, say, top three? Top three, I would say, are getting more and more clear cut. It's it's pretty much, it's cilantro, bull's blood, and rainbow mix. So rainbow mix is a mix of different varieties, but, it, but I still think of it in my head as, as one crop, because that's how we pack it out, is the rainbow mix. And it's a pretty standard rainbow mix. You know, a lot of microgreen companies and farms um, have a rainbow mix, and ours is, um, it's brassica based, you know, mustards, uh, kale, mizuna, amaranth, things like that. Um, so those are, those varieties like red kale, red kale, mustard mix, amaranth, mizuna, those are ones that I have to grow every week for the rainbow mix. Um, so yeah, the three top varieties, cilantro, bull's blood, and rainbow mix. Today it's Thursday, it's harvest day. What's the goal for today? So today, uh, this morning, you know, first thing I do when I get to the farm is I, I print out a spreadsheet of, of all, the, all the orders that we need to fill for the day. And so um, the goal for the day is, is well, the, the, the big goal for the day is pretty much to have, you know, our greenhouse cleared out more or less going into next week. Um, and so we hope that we get orders that allow us to do that. 
Uh, today we got a pretty decent, we have a pretty decent order list and then the good thing about on a day like today where it wasn't a huge order list is we can, we'll just pretty much everything that's left over we, we bring to a farmer's market tomorrow morning. And so that kind of times out perfectly so that on Thursday, you know, we do the, our, we do a distributor, a wholesale order and then a few restaurants and then whatever else we have left over we'll bring to farmer's market tomorrow morning. Um, so yeah, our goal for the day is just to um, harvest and cross things off the list pretty much and send invoices out. A couple things we've done too with our soil. Uh, a lot of people, they use hemp mats or something that's uh, they can compost. It could be a little bit easier. Um, but with this, with soil, it's a little bit different. So what I do is once we harvest, I'll actually put them, I'll give them to the chickens, let the chickens eat it, and then um, we can use that soil in other places in the garden. So I've actually started putting places where we can put wildflowers in instead for pollinators. Um, or we can use the enriched soil in the field. Right now you're uncovering peas, you're uncovering okay. sunflowers. Can you talk about the process of seeding these and how you prep the seed before it even gets into the soil. Sure, sure. So in each one of these, we'll take just about a cup of the seeds and then we'll put them in, we'll soak them overnight in water. And then the next day we, we come in, so this is one thing where it can be a little funky because they don't spread as easy as a lot of other seeds. And so basically just, just spread them as, as well as you can, as long as they're not just stacked up deep on top of each other. Um, they tend to work themselves out. And then uh, we spread them out in here, and then we give them a little bit of peroxide, again, um, and then water them, and then stack them for about two days until they sprout. Um, and then unstack, we'll give them a little peroxide, and then water them down, and then leave them on the overhead, overhead uh, misuse. But I would imagine if somebody doesn't have the setup with the misting, they can just hand water. They, they do pretty well with that, too. And then the cool thing about these crops, you can kind of see from over there, they're almost bulletproof. Um, they're excellent. I mean, these taste phenomenal. Um, and they grow real fast. So these will be ready by Monday. So then, from, from a disease prevention standpoint, you soak them in a diluted hydrogen peroxide solution. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Then you seed them into the tray, you spray them down with some peroxide then, mm -hmm. stack them, and then spray them again when they come out of the stack. So you're they're really getting three exposures to peroxide to control any sort of disease. Um, they are getting, let's see, uh, one, yes, three, absolutely. But it's very deadly. It's very deadly. It's something you could use as a as a mouthwash, yeah. you know. And it's just enough to keep any kind of fungal pathogens off. And the summertime is not a big deal. Um, and it might be a little overkill for for these guys here. But the, the problem is is we're touching this stuff. And you're moving it around, the fans are blowing spores around if it's fungal. The other thing too is once they get into the water, um, they're all soaking up the same water. So if you know one tree has a problem and the water is you know it's getting soaked up in there, then it can splash around and so forth. Um, it's just kind of a hassle to go through. Now I have to say that sunflowers and peas are almost trouble free. Um, and that's because they get harvested really, really early in about five to seven days. So, or about seven, seven to eight days or so. Some of the ones that last a little bit, that take a little bit longer to get to maturity, you might, you might have more disease pressure. Like these are beets, see, and they're kind of hard to spread around because they, you know, you, you can't just shake them around once they're wet. Um, but I suppose if somebody, if you wanted to skip the step of soaking, um, it just helps with germination. Um, you could probably get it more even, which mm -hmm. might help with, with disease pressure too. Do you spray any of the other crops with that peroxide solution? Like outside crops? Uh, inside any of the other crops, like when they come out of the stack? Uh, we do everything. Okay, so everything when everything you unstack the same it. Treatment, yeah. Okay. And so then we'll, basically, oh, go ahead. And then we'll show you doing that. Yeah, yeah. So actually, everything, once it's all laid out flat, I'll just come through and just spray everything. Right. Yeah, with a mist. So let me, uh, let me do that now. One thing they do here at Sonoma Farm is make sure they have good procedures in place to help prevent disease on the crops. What you see them doing in the background right now is just spraying a diluted hydrogen peroxide solution over all of these newly unstacked seedlings. It's 3% hydrogen peroxide diluted down to 
one cup hydrogen peroxide to one gallon of water. Just trying to hit each tray about five times. Just give it some good coverage. Just an extra step that they've put in place to really try and mitigate any disease problems. This might take a little bit of extra time, but it's a little time and that little time is worth it when you compare the potential loss of losing a whole tray or having disease spread and take over and start to take root in your greenhouse. The general process for flow of water in the system is trays are watered once they're seeded, then they're stacked, they come out from the stack, they're hit with a mister, as you can see being done in the background. Then they get put on a separate table that's on an automatic timed misting system, which mists them for a few days. Once they've grown a little bit, they get moved from the misting table over to a flood table, and that's where they'll stay until they finish growing and they're harvested. They try and get them off the misting table as soon as they can because they tend to see more issues with disease and fungal pressures on those tables versus the flood tables themselves. One thing that I think you're gonna notice in this video about microgreens is there's a lot of monotony involved. It's a lot of steps that you're just doing over and over. Chris Thoreau has talked about the automaton of growing microgreens, meaning you're moving a lot of stuff from here to there repetitively. It's kind of like factory work because this is all systematized. You're seeding trays, you're stacking trays, you're unstacking trays, you're watering, you're harvesting, you're sanitizing trays, you're filling with soil. You're just doing it all over and over. That's the automaton uh, that comes into play when you're talking microgreens. And I think that can quickly turn a lot of people off some people want to get into this because of the money or it's farming, but they don't realize how real lab factory type work this is. Chris, again, calls it the automaton and it's a cross between an automaton and a scientist. You have to be able to troubleshoot growing techniques. You have to be able to troubleshoot disease problems, water issues, and then stack that on to doing repetitive steps over and over. So if you really want to do microgreens, especially at scale that's going to support you, your family, and create the type of money that you need to live the life that you want to live, be prepared to start doing the same thing over and over on a weekly basis. Now that they've unstacked all their trays that will lead to the next harvest, it's time to get into today's objective and actually harvest the trays that have grown out. They have to harvest about 40. They're going to go to wholesale customers, they're going to go to the farmer's market, and they're going to go to restaurants. We're going to see how they harvest coming up. So we will cut this by hand pretty much like this here. What we just come through and... So if you're doing it as a live tree, or you know, I say at a farmer's market and you're doing this live, or I would say if you have less than 50 trays, then it's not really a big issue. It could kind of work for you. And it gives you a chance to really kind of see the product up close. Of course, the big thing is making sure you don't get soil in there and keeping it consistent. So this is how we would do this. <laughs> last year and it would take imagine so we have for this one order there's four of these clamshells so this would take a little bit of time we pack it all in there and so forth but well, this guy this guy's about 500 bucks but this is three trees here yeah. Overall, how have you found it hand cutting versus using the quick cut greens harvester? Yeah, so this, to cut this whole tray, uh, would probably take just as much time to cut this whole thing. So this is gonna be for farmer's market. If, if someone's doing, man, just a couple of clamshells for a restaurant or, or something like that, then it might be practical to go this way. This, this is 500 bucks, so kinda have to weigh it out, but when you're looking at labor, especially when it's pretty, pretty good size operation, this would be the way to go. The other thing, this is also versatile because it's actually designed to be used in the field. So if you're doing lettuce and so forth, you can use it outside as well too. It's for the crops. So that, you know, you get a multiple use out of it. I think it was like a, 
an extra employee. <laughs> as bad as that sounds, right? If somebody wants to get hired. That's made your job a lot easier. It's made my day. job a lot easier. Well, the thing is, is uh, we, can, we can do more. So we can actually have more clients. Um, and f- yeah, it, it just helps. It's, it's a required piece of equipment probably at this point. I would say so. Because we, we worked without it for almost a year. And um, there's only so much production you can do by hand. You know, and it's only so, so much consistency you can get. So you can see here where I've kind of missed some things. Um, and, but so this is all revenue stuff. So for example, the way these are cut here, they're going to cut a lot lower and more consistency without pulling up the soil. So every time I cut by hand, I'm looking to see if I pulled up any soil in it by, you know, just missing something here. These guys, you just run it too slow. It cuts everything, um, keeps it consistent. And the other thing too, it, it gets you more product too. So you're looking at more like that. Um, the only thing I would say, if you do have a little disease pressure, say this had a little funkiness in the middle and you wanted to cut around it, then you have to go by hand. So then you have to you know, cut around it or something like that. Um, but other than that, I would say that would be the way to go. 500 bucks, you know, you can get somebody who had one, doesn't need it anymore. <laughs> but uh, yeah, that's the way to go. And then, so, then we put these guys in clamshells here. These are 24 ounce clamshells. For us, we pack them in with two absorbent tray pads, uh, but it depends on the supplier. Sometimes these are going to go primarily to chefs and kitchens, and so they're not going to pay too much attention to it. They just want it to look decent and, and keep. Yeah, but sure. if it's going to go into a, say, a facility where somebody's going to be looking at the top, or if it's like in a like in a fridge case at a res- at a supermarket, then. The supplier might ask that you do it without the top on it, which works too. But the only thing is, you just it, it's going to breathe a little bit, and you're going to get a little more condensation on the top. So, but you know, it, it depends. I mean, if they're kept cold, we just put these in right away. These will be uh, at the restaurants in a couple hours, so it's going to go from fridge to fridge, um, and it'll keep full well. Some great points brought up there. You know, just comparing the two. How are you selling them and where are they ending up? What does your customer care about? If they need to see the product or they want to see the product or if it's important for you as the farmer that they do see the product, no absorbent pad on top, but you do put one in on bottom. If it's going to a chef who doesn't care what the product looks like, they just want it to last because they already know what's in here, put an absorbent pad on the top and bottom. The key here is having that absorbent pad in there. It just removes any excess moisture from the crop, which means shelf life in the fridge is going to be longer. One thing that they do here at the Sonoma Farm is make sure all the crops that they're harvesting are very dry. That means that they've opened up all their covers that protect the crops from rodents to get some airflow through there. They're not top watering anything or having any sort of misting going on during harvest day. It's to try and get as dry of a crop as you can from here into here. And then you have the absorbent pads in there to take up any moisture that the actual sprouts or microgreens output while they're in the container itself. One of the little tricks you can do on the farm, if you have crops that are growing fast ahead of schedule, like say you don't need to deliver a crop until Friday, but it's optimum and ready for harvest on Wednesday, what do you do? Do you harvest it on Wednesday and store it harvested in the fridge, or do you leave it in the greenhouse or wherever you're growing and harvest it on Friday when it's gone past optimum? Neither. You can do this if you have a walk-in and you have room in your refrigerator to do it. You take the whole tray live, growing, pop it in here, and what that's going to do is slow down the growth of the crop. So it can just sit in here basically dormant in stasis, and then you can pull it out and harvest it when you're ready. Harvest it at optimum conditions when you're ready. So if something's growing fast, something's growing ahead of schedule, put it in the freezer, put it in the cold, slow it down, and preserve that readiness until you're ready for it. One thing they do here at Sonoma Farm is they sell what they call rainbow mix. It's got kale, a mustard mix, and amaranth in it. It's essentially a salad in microgreen form. The nice thing about having mixes like that is you have some optionality with your crops. You can sell any of those crops individually, standalone. You could sell just kale micros, mustard mix micros, and amaranth micros. But if you can't move enough of them, or you need to get rid of extra trays, you blend them up into a mix and then you sell the mix on its own. Overall, it works great for them and it's actually their best seller here on the farm. 
A big part of success is knowing when not to do something. That's one little bit of wisdom I've heard here today on the farm, and I've seen that point illustrated here on the farm. They also have field crops at Sonoma Farm, but they're focusing on their microgreen operation right now because that's what works, that's what generates the bulk of cash flow. So the field crops behind me outside the greenhouse, they're sitting mostly fallow. There's one field totally tarped right now, and there's some long season crops like squash growing out in the field and tomatoes growing out in the field. They're not the cash flow providers this area is. So this area gets the attention, this area gets the focus. That stuff can be worked on later. They also look at crops that they're growing. If they can't do a crop well, or they can't sell a crop, and they're having to work extra hard to force a crop onto the market, they don't grow it. You sell a lot of microgreens to wholesalers. What are some keys for success when selling to wholesalers as a small farm? I would say definitely, um, you know, do your research. Also, I would say, I wouldn't necessarily start a, gre a microgreen operation um, and just try to start selling to wholesalers right away, especially if you haven't grown them before because the wholesale market really requires consistency um, of product, of both the quality and just securing that you have it week to week. So when I started, growing microgreens, I was bad at it, like every <laughs> beginner would be, and we had a lot of crop loss all the time, and I was selling mostly to, I was selling mostly at a farmer's market then, and, and that's obviously way more uh, forgiving. You know, cu customers, if you don't show up one week with um, radish, then you're fine, whereas if a wholesaler is requiring that, then you can only go so many times where you say, sorry, I don't have a product before. They're probably going to say, well, well, we're just going to go back to our old supplier, you know, some huge warehouse microgreen grower that is obviously have, has everything automated and everything's going to be pretty consistent. So I would say be, cons you know, get to a point where you're consistent with your product and the quality and um, see what the, if you can find out, find out what wholesalers are currently distributing. Uh, I find that wholesalers are overall less experimental than like a chef. Um, you know, they want to, they don't want to have to week in and week out think about like, oh, let's push this new weird product. They probably want to push, in my experience, a few key products, a, key, a few key varieties. You know, for us it's cilantro, bulls blood, and rainbow mix. Um, and for in a different location, it might be something totally different. It could be pea shoots. We, you know, so um, yeah. You sell to three existing distributors now. If you're going to pitch a new distributor to try and get your product into their lineup, give me an example of like how that conversation would go. Um, I find that now at this point. Um, I think at first I was a little bit shy about mentioning like, oh, we sell to, you know, we already sell to some distributors. I just didn't know what that, what the politics were about, just be how transparent you were supposed to be. In my experience, I think now that I've already sold to, I already sell to a couple, it helps to say, you know, we're distributing, we could, you can even name them. We're distributing to these distributors up in, in the San Francisco area, but you know, we want to push down more if you're trying to get into a new area. We want to get more into the, let's say I'm trying to get into the Sacramento market, um, which I'm not, but let's say hypothetically I am. Like I would say, yeah, well, we're already distributing to these wholesalers in the Bay Area, and you know, I know that the distributors that I sell to have a good reputation. And uh, there goes an the irrigation. Uh, you know, by name, you know, try to give a little bit of your, uh, paint a good picture of your reputation. Tell tell them who you already sell to, um, and and then you know, pretty quickly they're going to want to talk price. Um, and so I would have those numbers in mind before you go into it. Don't uh, you know? And I would I, I would you know give them the price that you want to sell at. Um, so so aim high. And uh, they'll probably talk you down a little bit because um, they're they're wholesalers, so they're going to be buying at a wholesale price. But there's no harm in, in shooting overshooting what you hope to sell to them for, and then you know compromising to the the price point you have to. And as a grower, the trade-off is always margin versus moving volume in one sale. At this point. 
What's the lowest margin you're willing to take on a wholesaler? Um, I would say that we still want um, each tray to be worth at least $15. So, um, depending on the variety, I might be able to, with a variety that, you know, like produces um, a greater yield, like a radish tray or something like that, um, then I might be able to, to compromise a little bit on the, on the margin, but I would say that I want each tray to produce for me at least $15. So if that means, um, you know, a particular variety only produces on average two clamshells per tray, clamshells being, you know, the deli containers per tray, then I uh, wouldn't want to charge any, any cheaper than $750, you know, per, um, per clamshell of that variety so that it equals $15 per tray. Now, I get some, for some of my customers, I get a better price than that. And so our, some trays for a particular customer um, can be worth, you know, upwards of $20, $25 a tray, but I don't want to go anything below $15 a tray. If you weren't selling to a wholesaler, could you move enough product to restaurants and farmers markets in your current area? I think I could. I think it would just be a hell of a lot more work. A lot more time out on the road. I, I mean, the economics makes sense for us with wholesaling, but like half of it is also just the quality of life. I mean, I love selling to restaurants. I love to um, interface with chefs and talk shop, and and uh, and I love the passion that those guys have for for the food and the, the ingredients that I'm selling to them. But um, I used to, we used to not, we used to just sell, our, our farm used to, we used to sell nothing to wholesalers and it was more vegetable focused and some microgreens and we sold CSA, which we don't do anymore, restaurants and the farmer's market. Um, if we, I mean right now if we stripped away our wholesale accounts then we would have to scramble to find, you know, uh, enough restaurant customers to cover our, our, our loss on that because the wholesalers just buy at such a, a quantity, um, you know, selling, moving $500 in, in one drop-off, you know, I've never even gotten close to that to a restaurant it, with microgreens. If you were a vet, mixed veg farm, uh, then, you know, I could see, you know, being able to drop off a $400, $500 or more order to uh, restaurants. But with the micros, I, um, I'm happy we're doing the wholesale route. With microgreens as successful as they are here on the farm, you have field crops, they're long season, and one field is tarped. How do you, what would you need to justify more effort in the field crops at this point, given the economic impact that microgreens has? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I think that we basically wanted to get to a point where the microgreens were kind of cash flowing the farm and or cash flowing the operation. Uh, we wanted to get to a point where um, the microgreens made sense on an economic um, level uh, so that they were you know paying for themselves and um, basically I don't want to say bankrolling the farm because we do make some money off of the veg but but making the farm a viable business and then um, from and, and we've kind of just gotten to that point and now uh, so I'm, I'm wanting to plant the field out for the fall so that we have a nice, thick, productive garden for the fall. Um, but obviously most of our energy and focus has gone to the microgreens. Um, I think that in order to justify focusing more on the field, we would just have to be able to keep our microgreen production, not have to compromise on our microgreen production at all, which I don't, I think we could do. I think we could focus more on the field and not compromise on this now that we have it so systematized. And we're pretty fast at it now because of the, the um, system that we put in place. And I wouldn't want to see our overall expenses go up much um, on the field inputs. So uh, basically I want to, you know, the microgreens are are productive and and um, profitable, but they they aren't like the absolute cheapest crop to grow because you are importing soil and you know it's a week to week seeding thing. So it's a you know the expenses are there, and so I would just I would I'm trying to find ways to with the long term with like the long standing stuff out in the field where you can 
uh, that's where I'm kind of drawn to that, you know, with, with things that, um, you know, as opposed to like salad mix. I've thought about doing, and we have done some, you know, salad mix, and now that we have the greens harvester, um, specializing, you know, focusing more on that kind of stuff, but then that almost feels like doing microgreens out in the field also, like almost like two quick turnover operations. So I kind of like having the super quick turnover microgreens and then in the field, you know, planting out fall like two once and done kind of crops, broccoli, cabbage, cauliflower, stuff that frankly isn't the most profitable per square foot on a small market garden scale, but um, is uh, less labor. So one of the somewhat unique things that Luke is doing here to grow microgreens is he's using flood tables to irrigate them. Flood tables or flood trays actually, just like this. He has the trays set out on tables here in his greenhouse and you can fit up to four 1020 trays in each flood tray. They're all then set on an automatic timer to fill up, irrigate the crop, and then there's small pinholes drilled in these flood trays to let the excess fall out. Currently that excess is just going onto the ground. They're gonna be working on the system to try and capture that water and recycle it and use it outside of the greenhouse. On your flood trays, can you just talk about the timing and how much water you're trying to put into the trays and how yep. all that water flows? So it's definitely been trial and error, um, and you know, a decent amount of error at the beginning for sure. Um, but with this system, uh, we irrigate every day. We used to irrigate five times a week, so we would take two days off, and we would um, those would be our harvest days because the product was still too wet from because even though it's sub irrigating, the moisture does creep up into the crop a little bit, and then it has to kind of drain out throughout the day. And but once we introduce the fans, we're able to irrigate every day and not worry about a crop uh, getting thirsty on a on a harvest day on one of those days where we didn't run irrigation. So we run irrigation every day. The, and we're talking about the flood irrigation now, so it goes every day. Um, and it, with, with our current system, with our flow rate and everything, it takes about, um, it takes about three minutes per table to, to fill up with water. So, um, so I run the irrigation for three minutes per table. So if I have one, two, three, four, five, all five tables going, then, it, then it'll take about, um, well, 15 minutes to flood the, whole, flood the whole greenhouse. But it's best to think about it just, I think, in terms of per table. It takes about three minutes, and that's enough time for the water to, to basically flood, and it reaches the, the trays, and then it gives it enough time to drain out um, through the holes that we've drilled into the trays. And yeah, one unique thing I've noticed on these trays is that the trays don't sit in the table. Mm -hmm. They're more suspended yep. up above the table. Exactly. So you have half an inch there, so nothing yeah. is ever sitting in right. static water. Right. right. Yeah, and the thinking for that is um, part of it was that, like with these trays here, these flood trays that we bought. The, the size was a little bit awkward where if we didn't have these binder clips that were that are kind of propping them up, they'd kind of be like half in and half out. And so I, I decided to just kind of uh, commit to making it so that they are elevated a little bit of, and we just use Staples binder clips. Um, and that gives them a little bit of a, a ledge to sit on. And I think that also does help with our disease so that we're not, um, you know, they're not sitting in water, they're not getting saturated. I mean, they, well, they are getting saturated, but then they dry out, you know, fast enough so that they're not getting bogged down. So really all you're trying to do is fill this up high enough to get water past mm -hmm. the bottom of the tray. Right, exactly. So um, basically, uh, you know, this is one table here, so we'd have it go for three minutes. And, you know, obviously, of course, typically this would be full. Uh, the whole the whole table, but this is just for demonstration. And so basically, you know, the water comes out of these tubes here. I just this is just simple irrigation tubing that I you know put up to these. These are like headers that you use like for drip irrigation out in the field. I already had a bunch of them, and so I just outfitted them onto these this tube these tubing here. And 
and um, these actually all used to be misting tables, and then I just popped, took the misters out, and I was like, oh, maybe I can just run a stream of water and fill, and so anyway, it comes down through there, and then uh, you can kind of see here that it's starting to hit the bottom of the tray, and then the soil, especially because, you know, our soil is always, we always keep it at a little bit of moisture, it never fully dries out. Um, that it, it wicks it, it wicks the, the, the moisture pretty, pretty fast. So, you know, it'll, it'll, you know, it's touching down there and already these roots and the soil is gonna be totally wicking all that moisture up. And then, you know, right before it starts to overflow, you'll hear, you'll hear it turn off. And then we've drilled holes sporadically in, in these uh, flood trays. And, you know, very slowly it, it uh, will, uh, drain out of the bottom. You don't want it to go, we'll want it to go too slowly because it, then that's where disease can start. Do you have a sense how, for how long the bottom of this tray is in contact with water given the yeah. drip, drip out rate? That's a good question. Uh, I don't have a perfect sense, but I would estimate it's probably it's probably only about five minutes maybe, but I could be wrong. That's something I should maybe observe. Um, but but we try to have it so that the flood trays you know drain out pretty fast just so that we don't get disease. One issue with these flood trays that we've so now you just you just heard it went off so now it'll start to drain. One issue with that can happen with these flood trays is um, they can get plugged up. The holes that we you know we just drill drilled with a drill bit they can get plugged up with you know um, seed holes eventually and so. Every now and then I'll be check, I'll come around and check to see if there's standing water in any tray. Actually, I see a tray over there that does have some standing water. And um, when that happens, you just have to, um, it's pretty easy. We just take, you know, take the micros off, you know, remove the tray, spritz it down, and uh, unplug those holes and it's good to go. Eventually, I think we're gonna switch over to a system where we plug just one drain into each tray. We've already done that with one. The thinking there is that um, maybe it'll get plugged, but, it, but it's only one thing you have to unplug as opposed to like 18 little holes that we've drilled. The two big advantages to flood irrigation, number one is it can be automated. You can have these flood trays irrigated on a timer for when you're here and for when you're not here. You don't have to stand over this and water it overhead. Now you might be saying, well, I could just water this overhead anyway, and that could be automated. Well, it could, but the second advantage of bottom watering from a flood tray like this is you don't have the water coming in contact with the top of the crops. A lot of microgreen growers don't like to wet the top of their crops because they don't want to get disease issues and they don't want to have soil kicked up onto the leaves. And some crops, they just never dry out when you go to harvest them. And really, you want to pack as dry of a crop as possible if you want to have it have a good shelf life. So bottom watering via flood tables, flood trays just like this solves the problem of not having to get the top wet when you water the crop. And it also solves the problem of being able to automate. So it provides water when plants need it and you're not here to give it to them. Should I grow microgreens? It depends. And Microgreens and profitability, that's one thing that attracts people to microgreens. And I wanna mention this in every microgreen video because I think it's really important. While you can sell a tray like this of microgreens for around $20, the whole key comes down to can you actually sell it for $20 and can you sell a bunch of these for $20? Because this is a great dollar value per pound product to sell, but really if you want to scale this and support you in the lifestyle that you want to live, you got to move volume of these because if you make $15 on a tray that you sell for $20, that's great, but selling one tray a week, 15 bucks, maybe you can put some gas in your car and that's about as good as you're going to get. If you want to make a living off this, you got to move volume. One way Luke has found a way to move volume up here has been to sell to distributors, something not so common in the small veg world, but it might be something where there's some opportunity in your area. 
farmer's markets are another alternative, but I don't know how much microgreens you can actually sell at a farmer's market. So you're gonna to have to be moving them probably to a more commercial source, a distributor, a grocery store, or the restaurant scene if you wanna scale up and do volume. Here they're doing about 100 trays a week. 100 trays pays for Luke, it pays for his salary, and it pays for his partner Rob's salary here as well.